ever have like one of those weeks where you just like go through it and it never seems like it's going to end? And then you actually find yourself waking up on the Sabbath day questioning if you should go to church because all you want to do is just rest, <laughs> which doesn't sound like a bad thing on the Sabbath. And then you get here and you just know you made the right choice. I'm having one of those days, so I am glad to be here. Um, and I'll go ahead and have everybody turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 4. In my messages the past few times, I have been talking about God's word and how in God's word we find refuge, we take refuge. And I find it fitting today to go ahead and just talk about God's word, how God's word is sufficient and how God's word is the ultimate authority in our lives. So 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, we read, I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. That deserves an amen. Because there is not a time coming. The time is now and has been that people have itching ears, that they are turning away from sound doctrine. But what are we told in the word. We are told, preach the word. God's word. We preach that because as we're told in Acts 4 verse 20, for we cannot speak, we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And what we have seen and heard can only be found in his word. There's no other place to find it. It is only revealed in his holy and inspired scripture. Written down by holy men, inspired by the Holy Spirit. We preach the word. Ready in and out of season, no matter the time, we are ready to preach the word. And we reprove, rebuke, and exhort according to the word. And we do that with patience and teaching. We do not shove it down people's throat, but with patience, with love, compassion, we preach the word and we teach the word. That does not mean that we cannot have zeal and passion for the word, but there is a way to go about preaching the word that speaks love and truth. We are to preach the word, and we are in desperate need of preaching the word during these times. And again, everyone is a preacher. This does not just go to people who stand behind the pulpit, but anyone who has a message to herald of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you are a preacher. We preach the word. We speak on what we have seen and heard from God's word. Go ahead and turn over to Psalms 19. Psalms 19. And we'll read verses 7 through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true 
and righteous all together. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Yes and amen. I really don't need to say much on that. But if I may just quickly go through and expound a little bit on each of these, because what we have to realize in verses 7, 8, and 9, we have three verses with six thoughts. And in each of those thoughts, there are three parts, three components. There is a title to the word of God. There is a characteristic to the word of God, and there is a promise to the word of God, a yes and an amen to the word of God. And these are all descriptions of the word of God because it says the law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the precepts of the Lord, the commandment of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the rules of the Lord. All of this is speaking towards God's sufficient word. It says the law of the Lord, the doctrine and the teaching of of God's word is perfect. It is blameless. There is nothing wrong with God's teaching, doctrine, and law. It is perfect. It is complete. It is sufficient. And it is reviving the soul. It is only through the law that we can actually see our sinfulness, to see our transgressions. And it is only then that we see our need for our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then our soul begins to convert because it is the law that reveals our transgressions and sends us to Jesus Christ. And it is in Him that we are converted. It is in Him that we find salvation. So yes, the law of God, the law of the Lord is perfect. It works the testimony of the Lord is sure. The witness of the Lord is sure. It is worthy to be believed because the witness of God's word testifies to Jesus Christ himself. Every word in scripture points to Christ. Whether it's written in red letter or black letter, it all points to Christ. It is sure and worthy to be believed and it makes wise the simple. And I stand before you now, a simple man. I'm the guy who got a GED, or as real people call it, a GED. I was home taught, not homeschooled, because homeschoolers are actually smart. I was home taught though. And when I went to go get my GED, I wrote a paper on Brett Favre and barely passed. But these words, they make sense. These words show me the wisdom of God. They make wise the simple. No matter where we are on our walk, there is wisdom here, and everyone who truly searches can understand it. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The precepts, the guidelines of God's word are right. The ways that God says live this way are right. They are not wrong. Plain and simple. He sets up guidelines for us to live by and they are right. And we know, we know that when we don't live by those guidelines, how we're in the wrong, how things don't make sense. It is only when we walk according to his precepts and guidelines that our lives make sense because God has revealed his truth to us. The precepts of the Lord are right and they rejoice the heart. We find joy in walking in God's precepts, in his guidelines. According to his word, we find joy, we find delight. Because it is only when we walk according to his word that we find meaning for our lives. It is his word that led me to Christ. It is his word that says that I have his Holy Spirit dwelling within me. 
that cries out, Abba, Father. His precepts are right, and they rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The commandments, God's binding authoritative commandments are pure. And again, he is God. We are not. He created us. He has every right to put certain rules in place that we must live by. He is not wrong in that because they are pure. Again, nothing wrong not contaminated, they are pure, they are true, they are clear and precise. We look in this word and we can see his commandments revealed to us by the revelation of the Holy Spirit working within us. It leads us into all truth and shows us what God's commandments are, what we are to follow, what we are to do and not to do. And they enlighten the eyes. They bring light to us in the darkness. Again, this world is dark. Satan is out there having a field day. Pretty much everything he does, it works right now. Because the world is embracing the darkness. But God's word has enlightened our eyes. His commandments have enlightened our eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The fear of the Lord. There is nothing wrong with having a good, healthy fear of God. You need a good, healthy fear of God. It is only in that fear, that reverence, that awe of who God is, that we go to him. God has the power to wipe this earth completely clean of everyone. And he would not be in the wrong to do that. Because God is the holy, just, perfect one. But he has it because God has mercy. But because he has that power, I fear him. But I am also in awe because with all that power, He shows mercy. He does not completely wipe us off this planet. I am in awe of how amazingly loving, gracious, and merciful, and kind, and faithful our God is. I am in awe. And in that awe, in that reverence, in that respect to my God, I am clean because it is in that fear and awe and wonder that I go again to Christ. And in Christ, I am made clean. His blood washes me of all my sins and iniquities. Everything I've done in the past, everything I've done today, everything I'll do tomorrow and forevermore, I am washed clean because my God is faithful Jesus Christ has cleansed me. He has made me uncontaminated. In faith in him, I am justified and stand before God righteous. Not because of anything I've ever done or anything I've never not done, but because of everything that Jesus Christ did, I can stand before God justified. I am in awe of our God. And that cleansing power from Jesus Christ endures forever. Again, all my past sins and all my future sins. In faith in Jesus Christ, I am cleansed. And the rules of the Lord are true and righteous all together. The rules or the just decrees of the Lord All his judgments that we see revealed in his word are true. They are just. Again, God is the perfect, holy, righteous judge. 
He does not make a bad judgment. All his judgments are true. They are perfect. They are right. And they are righteous all together. This is God's word. God's word is sufficient. God's word is perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, and true. And it is to be more desired than gold, even much fine gold. Any amount of money does not amount to what treasure we find revealed in God's word. Nothing compares. It is the treasure of God's word that has shown me who my Savior is, who my Lord is, who my King is, what he has done for me, knowing that I could never do enough. And he paid the price. Again, Freddie's talked about it. It was an expensive price, one that I could never pay, one that none of us could ever pay, even if we all tried to work together to raise up enough money. It would never work. It was far too expensive. But Christ paid it. Those words revealed here are more precious than anything ever. They are sweeter than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. There is nothing sweeter that I could ever hear than God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever might believe on him might have everlasting life and not perish. That me, being unjustified, the sinner, walking in unholiness, lawlessness, in faith, by the grace of God, in faith, in Jesus Christ, again, I stand before God righteous, there is nothing sweeter. Take all the honey in the world and you can have it. The words of God are sweeter than honey. And moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. There's our caveat. We see the truth revealed here in the word. But David says in this psalm, we are warned by God's word. And there is great reward in keeping them. And it is in this that we need to realize that God's word in our lives has the ultimate authority. It is sufficient. Will anyone argue that? Good. It is sufficient. So it should hold the ultimate authority in our lives. Turn over to Matthew 15. Matthew 15, and we're going to read verses 1 through 9. says, then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. He answered them, and why do you break the commandments of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God. He need not honor his father. So for your sake, your tradition, for, or so for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of man. And here Jesus plainly says, when you have two standards, traditions of man, call it whatever you want, going up against the word of God, 
the word of God has the ultimate say-so. Nothing else. But the Pharisees in this passage are showing that they're trying to be more holier, more spiritual than everyone else. Because it sounds kind of good, right? They say, we're told to honor our mother and father. And it was expected that when your parents got to a certain age, you were to take care of them. I wish we saw more of that today. And I hope that if y'all ever get to that point, <laughs> that I'm able to live up to that thought. To take care of, to truly honor, not just say good things about them, but to take care of them, show them respect, give them some reverence and awe for all that they've done for you. But the Pharisees say, anything you would have gained from me, I've given it to God because I'm such a good and holy person. And Jesus says, you have made void the law of God, the word of God, because of your silly, stupid traditions. This people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they do worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And again, the traditions, the doctrines of men, it doesn't just have to be this type of stuff. Things that fall under the theological category. We see it in Mark 7, a perfect example of it. It's the parallel passage of this. And what does everybody slide in there? Because it's, you know, you hear everybody say, Scripture must interpret itself. But in Mark 7, they throw in the caveat where Jesus says, and thus he cleansed all food, purified all foods. Now we don't have to listen to the food laws. Some of them will put it in red even, saying that Jesus actually said that. But the overwhelming majority of manuscripts found of Mark do not have that in it. It was added because the doctrines of men, their tradition said, we can eat whatever we want. So just slide it in there and it will be fine. But God's word does not reveal that. If you just, in context, read farther down in Matthew 15, verse 20, Jesus says, these are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. Jesus is simply talking about eating with dirty hands because that's what the Pharisees were freaking out about. That was their tradition, that if you don't wash your hands before you eat, you're unclean. God says, no, if you eat the unclean foods that I have told you about, you're unclean. The clean foods, those are good to eat. And do not get this twisted. I am not saying that eating clean foods is what makes us righteous, to stand before God justified. There is no amount of clean food that I can eat, and there is no amount of pepperoni that I cannot eat that's going to make me clean and justified before God. It is only Jesus Christ and his work, because that is what Scripture reveals, but it also tells me to walk a certain way. Again, though, Replace the traditions of men with anything. We live in a time where there are so many political ideologies out there. And to an extent, they sound good, maybe at face level. This is probably the most political I'm ever going to sound. But take the sentence, Black Lives Matter. If I take that and I look at it through the lens of Scripture, the sentence, Black Lives Matter, I have no problem with it. Amen, hallelujah. Just like when I look at the sentence, all lives matter and blue lives matter. Pick any color, it does not matter. Jesus died for everyone. But if I look at the organization, you're not getting an amen or a hallelujah out of me. I'm sorry. Just to take two quick things. One of the things that they believe in is every white person is racist. My Savior did not die on the cross to leave people who truly come to him as a racist with hate in their hearts. 
No. That is not revealed in Scripture. And they also want you to bow before their organization. I bow to Christ and Christ alone. No one else is worthy of me kneeling before them. That is what Scripture reveals. And that is what we have to do. We take everything and we look at it through the lens of Scripture. It doesn't matter if it's Black Lives Matter, socialism, Marxism, social justice. It does not matter. Look at it through the lens of Scripture and see if it holds up to Scripture. If there is fault in it, it's not good. Plain and simple, God's word is good. As it said in verse 7 of Psalms 19, the law of God is perfect. If it does not line up with God's perfect word, then it doesn't line up. This is our level that we hold up to everything. The level tells us what's straight and what's not. Even if you look at it and you deem in yourself that it's straight, if that level does not say it is straight, then it is not straight. And we don't try to bend it to fit. We cast it out. If it does not line up with God's word, it does not line up with God's word. But let's take it another level. What traditions have we made in our own lives? Look at yourself. Examine yourself. Again, according to God's word. If I were to come to you and say that we should only on the Sabbath, starting at sundown, Friday evening, through sundown, Saturday evening, you are only allowed to listen to hymnals. If you listen to anything else, you are in sin. That is a very clear example of tradition of man. I made that up myself. I haven't found that in God's word. I don't know if you knew that or not. But what else? Our thoughts and our feelings. It makes us feel better if we think of it this way. So we bend it and twist it a little bit in order to line up. If it doesn't fit the scriptures, it doesn't fit God's word. It doesn't fit what God says. Turn over to 1 Chronicles chapter 13. Our thoughts and our feelings can get us into trouble. And this will be a hard word, but it is God's word. First Chronicles 13, and we'll start in verse 5, and there's a lot of names that I don't know how to pronounce, so bear with me. But... Verse 5 says, So David assembled all Israel from the Nile of Egypt to Lebo Hamath to bring the ark of God to Karathe Jerem. And David and all Israel went up to Bala, that is to Karath Jerem, that belongs to Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the cherub, or called by the name of the Lord, who sits enthroned above the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart from the house of Abinadab. And Uzzah and Ahio were driving the cart. And David and all of Israel were celebrating before God with all their might, with song and lyres and harps and tambourines and cymbals and trumpets. And when they came to the threshing floor of Chidion, Uzzah put out his hand to take hold of the ark, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he struck him down because he put his hand to the ark, and he died there before God. And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah, and that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of God that day, and he said, How can I bring the ark of God home? To me. So David did not take the ark home into the city of David, but took it aside to the house of Obed Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of God remained with the household of Obed Edom in the house three months. 
and the Lord blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that he had. David was trying to do a good thing. I don't think there was anything wrong with wanting to bring the ark back to Jerusalem. But he did it the wrong way. God clearly instructed how the ark was to be handled. And for time's sake, I'm not going to go into all those particulars, but they were supposed to wrap it up and slide poles in, and the Levites were supposed to carry that ark on their shoulders by holding on to the poles. But what did they do? They just threw it on a cart that the oxen carried or pulled. And Uzzah, as far as we can tell, had a good heart, had the right intention. He loved the ark. But again, God's word is clear. If you touch the ark, you die. It is clear. And while it might be a hard word to hear, God is not worried about our best intentions. He's not worried about what we feel or what we want. He is worried about what he says to us. What his word reveals to us. Flip over a few pages to chapter 15 of 1 Chronicles. Verse 2, it says, Then David said that no one but the Levites may carry the ark of God. For the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of the Lord and to minister to him forever. And then drop down to verse 12. And David said to them, You are the heads of the fathers' houses, of the Levites. Consecrate yourselves, you and your brothers, so that you may bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to place to the place that I have prepared for it. Because you did not carry it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not seek him according to the rule. So the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. And the Levites carried the ark on the ark of God on their shoulders with the poles, as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. Again, it is what God's word says and reveals to us that matters most. It holds the ultimate authority in our lives because it comes straight from God. And our best intentions don't matter if they do not line up with what God's word says. We can only speak of what we have heard and seen revealed by God's word. Anything else doesn't matter. Again, scripture reveals to me who God is, that he is the creator of all things, that he is the only one worthy of glory, honor, and praise by and through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he is worthy of that fear and respect to walk according to what he says. Because again, if it wasn't for him, none of us would be here. If it wasn't for his grace and mercy, he could wipe us all away right now. But he is faithful. That is what his word reveals. Look to the word and line yourself up with the word. The only thing we bend to God's word is our knees. We submit because he has the final say-so in our lives. Turn back over to Psalms 19. Psalms 19, and we'll read verses 12 through 14. David says, Who can discern his errors? 
Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Again, we have to examine ourselves according to the word. David says, of all the sins that I willingly do, God, prevent me from doing those. Have your work in me. But he also says, reveal to me those things which are hidden. Those thoughts that I have that don't line up with your word, reveal them to me. By the power of God's Holy Spirit, we have to look to his word and have all truth revealed to us. It is only by the Holy Spirit. It leads us into all truth. Look to God's word and find where we might be at fault, whether it's hidden or willingly. If it's willingly, ask God to sanctify you in it. Work with me in it. We all have sins that hide in our lives, again, willingly or hidden. And there is nothing wrong with looking to God's word to, to uh, expose those faults. God wants us to, to sanctify ourselves, to make ourselves a holy, peculiar people set apart from the rest of the world. And we can only do that if we live by his word, because his word is sufficient. Closing thoughts for the last nail in the coffin, I suppose. Turn over to John. John chapter 1. Verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Again, God's word testifies of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And all these words point to him. Malachi 2 verse 8 says, But you have departed from the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. Psalms 19, verse 142. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. Your law is truth. Proverbs 6, 23. For the commandment is a lamp and the law a light. Reproofs of instructions are the way of life. God's word is the way, the truth, and the life because it all points to Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, the life. The law and the prophets, every single word, again, whether it's written in red or black, points and testifies to our wonderful and great Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We cannot throw it to the side. All of it points to him. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And God's word testifies to that. So again, if we bend anything, we bend our knee to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and to his word, because Jesus Christ is the word. <laughs>